Tantra is a, a tradition, it's texts, it's, it's practices and within those practices are some of the very basic things that we need to feel the full vitality of our life. Mm -hmm. um, and so Tantra works with polarities, with the masculine and the feminine energy that is present within us and then the balance of the two. Hey, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have Lisa Cormod. Lisa is a yoga teacher. She has trained in Vinyasa, Yin, Kundalini and traditional Tantra across India, South America, Bali and London. Tantra has been a huge passion of Lisa's, which she first discovered in South India. And she trained as a teacher across India and South America, as well as continuing personal studies and online. Lisa also studied shamanism, cosmology and plant medicine in Ecuador. She is an aesthetic dance DJ and facilitator. She brings live beats to every event and experience. Lisa is also a meditation and mindfulness coach and relaxation therapist. Let's bring her on. So Lisa, how are you doing? Yeah, um, it's uh, been a, a, a fast start to this year, really. Um, I feel like I'm kind of catching up on myself quite a bit mm -hmm. and um, I can feel a lot of change happening and change is both exciting and scary and a little bit exhausting and exhilarating so it's all the things and yeah. all the things. Yeah I know and I, we were just talking about the energy of um, the eclipse energy off air we were talking about it you know it's like very intense we are having to move, move, move in like getting into the zone of adventure. And then we like, it's a mixture. And then you, you're you on the other end and then you're at the other end. You know, it's like swinging left, right. <laughs> right? It really and is. And eclipses are, well, they're, they're the agent of change. So mm -hmm. eclipses are all about endings and beginnings. And actually mm -hmm. one doesn't exist without the other. So every ending is a new beginning. Mm -hmm. Do you feel the eclipses are, um, it's like, it's, it's really important how you channel the eclipses energy. You know, like I said, you can easily get, it's so intense that you can easily just swing one way, but then, but then you could completely have a breakdown on the other, other way, you know? Um, the end, the, so it's like, it's like the way I explain it, it's like, you know, split two ends, if, mm. if, you know, on the video, I'm like split into ends really. So like, if you really channel, like I'm saying, I've, I've got such amazing people coming on my podcast, like yourself and other people who come in and it's just, everything has been fast, 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 fast. And your big guns come in and this, this is happening. That's happening. And I'm riding in that energy like for a past week or so, but I'm feeling like I'm kind of just zapping into the other end of it as well. Um, but it's really important to look at what's happening at the other end because a lot of a lot of us run away from our emotions, you know, um, as you would agree, because we we get into this line of work, right? Energy, everything is energy. Emotions is energy. Yeah, exactly. And um, it, they really are just two ends of the same spectrum, aren't they? Like mm -hmm. happiness and sadness are two ends of the same sausage. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Said it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so I'm just thinking back how we first met. Um, I can't remember when we first met. Do you remember? I think it was through one probably event through Paulina. Uh, our friend Pauline and Joanna and Liam and Liam yeah. um, and uh, yeah so we just started just um, being in the same circle came to your sound healing I came to your yin yoga that for the first time that was my first time experience of yin yoga wow. um, yeah and then yeah so I just really felt the call to bring you on this podcast because obviously you have 
a lot of stuff that you know a lot of wisdom and knowledge that you you can share with our audiences so to start off with um tell us a bit about yourself who is lisa Ooh, I mean, <laughs> how is that the trickiest question to answer <laughs> um yeah so i am finding myself at middle age now um where I'm starting to look back a little bit more than I have done before at what has brought me to this point in life and then more so what is not serving me anymore Um, and so I've lived many lives in this one life (laughs) (laughs) Um, I've kind of I've been the pleasure seeker, you know, I was the the real kind of hedonistic girl in my late teens, early 20s, always seeking high, um, quite extroverted. And I was a podium dancer. I then worked on cruise ships. I was an air hostess for many years. I've traveled the world, backpacked around the world. Um, And then post 40, that all began to change. And Mm. I really, probably like you you were talking about this pendulum swing from one end to the other, uh, my introvert side really came apparent that she needed nourishing. And um, I started to, I guess, be called more to, introspection and quietness and um an alone time um and also the tendency to kind of need to be um I don't know like a people pleaser let's say that I'm a recovering people pleaser (laughs) that comes Um, up a lot (laughs) Um, and I, I started to get more in touch with the, I'm going to say the, the real me, even though all those past versions of me were equally real, they were maybe more surface level, um, and, and looking for a, a need for validation and approval. And I would, I recognize all the places where I put the opinion of others so the the voices outside of me more favorably than than the ones that were coming from the inside and so um over the past few years there's been a real deep dive into self-awareness and um yeah looking looking more inward Mm, that's really beautiful because they do say apparently life starts at 40 <laughs> they do say that I would say that inner work starts there as well <laughs> yeah. a lot of stuff um so I just wanted to know like what was your childhood like you know let's go back to um Lisa as a as a youngster were your parents around you how, what was your upbringing your background um were you originally from the UK uh huh. So, um, Manchester born and bred. <laughs> um, I come from a very working class family, and my mum actually was really young when she got pregnant with me, and she didn't even tell her mum until she was eight months pregnant. Wow. So she hid it under jumpers. Yeah, she hid me, a little bean, under jumpers until she was eight months pregnant. Um, and I mean, she was 18 um, and we lived with my grandparents. So as soon as I was born, my mum continued her life as, a, as an 18 year old. So I was pretty much for the first few years brought up by my grandparents, really. Mm. Um, my dad left. He was also young. Um, so I have nothing, no contact with my father whatsoever. I have no idea where he is right now. Um, my mum was very much a, a friend. Mm. So, um, you know, it wasn't that I felt abandoned by my mum in, in any way. 
I just kind of observed her life and um, I was, I'm an only child. So yes, me too. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so you, you develop ways and means of entertaining yourself, mm -hmm. of becoming self-sufficient. Um, and so, yeah, I have memories of spending a lot of time by myself. Um, I remember putting on little concerts <laughs> <laughs> <How is it? laughs> um, for my teddy bears. And when I look back at that now, I think actually, not, not to sound in a sad way, but I was trying to escape from the person that I was. And mm. I didn't quite maybe like who I was, even though I was really young. Mm. Um, so I was trying to be someone else even then. I was trying to feel like I was someone special. Mm. Um, and I had this idea that I wanted to be a magician's assistant. No, <laughs> and <I> so... <laughs> I'd wear the little tutus and and the, the the glitter and I'd try to contort myself into cupboards and boxes. <laughs> I love it. I love but it. Then one day I actually got trapped in a wardrobe in my greatest trick ever. I got trapped <laughs> in it, somehow I had the key inside with me. It was a really old, musty vintage wardrobe and I was stuck in there and I really thought that that was going to be the end of me and that, you know, my mum would come and find this skeleton in a tutu, <laughs> in a plastic wand. <laughs> and that would be where my life ended. But um, no, I was rescued. Mm. And uh, that was the end of that career. <laughs> <laughs> Not going down that path again. <laughs> no, but I think that um, some part of me has always wanted to bring magic into what I do. And um you know, they say that there's two types of people, the type of person that sees a magic trick and wants to know how it's done, and the type of person that sees a magic trick and wants to believe it's real. And, um, you know, I think I've, I've dedicated a lot of my life to being it, wanting to see the magic and the, the beauty in the, the everyday and the ordinary, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, uh, going back to your... Um obviously your dad so um you've never wanting to wanted to see your dad or like wanting to know who your dad was or you know that kind of thing well there's a curiosity um, there um at the same time it's not as though I felt that void hmm. um I, I feel even though I've got a very small family a very small family hmm. um I have always been content so yeah. Um, other than wondering, oh, what if I need some of his plasma or <laughs> bone yeah. marrow or something medical? What if there's something I need to know? The it, it hasn't really been been at the forefront now. Oh, that's amazing because, like, I remember obviously my dad, um, my dad passed away, but like, um, when I was three, he moved to the UK. From there, now going into IFS, if you heard of internal family system, there's a lot of stuff that's been coming up in terms of uh, abandonment, wound of abandonment's been coming up. You know, that's a deep rooted a core wound. And I remember like this this uh, memory of my dad leaving at age of three, and like I'm um, like I can remember him leaving, and then finally see him at age of seven. Um, thinking oh yeah I'm with my dad again and then he passes away at the age of 13 so it's like that wound of abandonment so I feel like you know because it always goes back to your care caregivers and caretakers and then it plays out in your relationships have you ever wondered like have you ever been in relationships where it just felt like you've had wound of abandonments or fear of rejections like people please is one of it right you know yeah yeah for sure um and I think that I've been given the gift of self-awareness where um, I, I did recognize that mm. from quite a young-ish age, let's say. It probably yeah. took me till my 20s. But still, I, I saw where I was seeking validation from men to feel accepted and needed and, and wanted as, as a, a female. Mm. Um, and when I, when I do see that happening from outside of myself, and then this is where this, all this work has come in really mm -hmm. of, 
you know, like you say, the inner work. Um, yeah, yeah. Not to um, not to hurt others with your own hurt. You know, um, I see. I try to recognize when wounds are open up and and where that comes from. Mm. Um, yeah, you're doing amazing work. So, were you brought up? in a in a spiritual family I know you're spiritual now uh, but were you always spiritual is your family um, spiritual no not at all um and I, I think you know I was born in 1979 so as a as a, a kid being brought up in the ages spirituality then was either hippies wearing baggy colorful clothes um or it was religious, you know, a, re a religious faith, a religious following. And I think that they're intertwined completely. Um, but, you know, from from my working class family's opinion, it was that God was this man in the sky with a white beard and long hair and robes, and we wouldn't bow to him. Um, but in terms of spirituality, again, going back to like the element of recognizing magic, I've always felt that there's something outside of me that's very powerful. To so when I was young, I would kind of bargain with the universe. So even then I'd call it universe and I'd say, okay, universe, I'm gonna light this candle. And if I can walk from my bedroom to the bathroom and it doesn't go out, then I'm going to pass my maths test. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So it's always looking for signs and angels and numbers and synchronicities that I was highly aware of from, mm. from a really young age. So I've always been intrigued by that. Mm. Um, but at the very same time, I don't know if it's because I spent quite a lot of time alone and also not influenced by siblings that I developed this like really curious disposition for humans. Mm. So for the human condition, I was very curious as to what made people act how they did and be how they were. Um, and I've noticed subtleties about people um, from a really young age. And um, I think that I had some kind of what I now realize is like psychic abilities in, in towards that where I, I could read auras and, um, and, and really sense people um, mm -hmm. without listening to the words that they were saying. Mm -hmm. So your uh, ultimate empath as well, aren't you? So it's like also, um, you know, going back to being curious, being the only child is you're always, you're always thinking of I wonder what it would be like if I had uh, a brother or sister. I'm going to find out. But what I did was I was trying to find it in other people, you see, because I didn't have that experience, obviously not going to have that experience, blood, brother, sisters, but I was having a lot of external making everybody my bro, my sis, and like, you know, that kind of energy. Um, to a point I kind of realized it's not that. Like, you know, you, you, you can't really feel it. You have to really you really need to experience it to feel it right you know um and did you ever feel that being the only child you felt like oh what it what what would have be, it would have been like for you to have had that a sibling love or uh, a sub support network yeah completely um you know it creeps in even now that there's a sense of loneliness that mm -hmm. I'm sure everyone feels regardless of what their family dynamic is 100%. Um, and I actually had imaginary brothers <laughs> <laughs> oh yes yeah, two taking it to brothers. amazing level I love this <laughs> so they um and they and the funny thing is I was a I, I used to watch Neighbours again. I'm a oh, kid yeah. in the 80s. So Everybody watched, needs good neighbours. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so Jason Donovan's character oh, yeah. on Neighbours was called Scott. So my two brothers were Jason and Scott. <laughs> I love how you split the name into two. Yeah. <laughs> you just basically split Jason like into split yeah. two. <laughs> I I love it. Me. in my in my um imaginary world um i had a great imagination which i think comes often from being an only child you, yeah. you have 
space for that as well um, oh. to conjure up d differing realities um, but I definitely felt the the loneliness of that especially when we moved when I went to um, infant school so um, my grandfather he moved our family to the area that I'm back living in now actually in the suburbs and um, the school that I went to there was very much a, a 2.4, you know, family, mum and dad still together. Everyone had a car. I was amazed. <laughs> we never had a car and we never went on holiday. So uh, I was I was then in a in a different environment to what I'd experienced. And um, and then being around most people had had a sibling at that mm. point and I felt like the odd one out in a way yeah, I never yeah. really felt like I fit in because I'd moved from somewhere else and um although no one would have known that because mm. I spent then my school years overcompensating for it in one way or another mm -hmm. and that's why the, yeah I guess that that's where the people pleaser comes in as well isn't it it's like um when you feel lonely then you agree to everything and everyone and you just want them to accept you you know um it's, it's a society community thing it's a massive community thing where we feel like we need to be accepted by it you know um yeah so um let's get into welcome this is your business right so what led you to create wild, wild come well this has been a culmination of my life experiences so everything really that i have learned back from being a magician's assistant <laughs> 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 um through to being a dancer being in nightclubs in the 90s um to travel in the world and everything in between really I, I have pulled together to come under this umbrella if you like of the wild calm so um putting those those two descriptions together wild and calm is is almost like um to show that we're everything we're we're, we're all of it you know we are both and that we're not this way or that mm -hmm. and that we can be both wild and calm and we absolutely are mm -hmm. um and so the business within that there is a calm side to it but there's mm -hmm. also a wildness to it as well so it is uh, multiple businesses in in one. <laughs> yeah. So what is it? What is it? What, what is the business itself? Um, so the business is a blend of I'm a yoga teacher. So I teach multiple classes a week in studios and also workshops and special events, master classes that um, are personal to the various teacher trainings that I've done. So I've done many yoga teacher trainings now. Yeah. I don't know if that's an addiction. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good but... addiction. I mean, it's calming. <laughs> Come on. You can be wild about it, but you can be calm about it as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but that that is my insatiable need for learning. Um, mm. So... I, I, I'm just, I'm a nerd. I'm going to say it. I'm a nerd. I love to just continuously learn and absorb and, mm -hmm. um, you know, keep seeking. We're seekers as human beings. And so that was what formed the foundation of it, really, the uh, yoga practice of my own. So I've been practicing yoga for 25 years now. Wow. I was 18 and I've primarily I got into it for the physical side of it I was like I want to do those fancy tricks <laughs> those people are doing that also they're all slim I want to do that so I was 18 years old my goal has shifted significantly if the, if there even is a goal now but um along the way I, I have kind of experienced a lot with yoga through yoga um and 
all of the the gifts that it gives back um mm-hmm. and it really is a lifeline for me yoga mm-hmm. um but then outside of that there's there's so many um like branches that are that we, we kind of think of yoga as being these physical shapes that we make on a rubber mat mm. wearing stretchy pants when um you know there there is so much more to it that's only one small aspect of it and so i also train to be a meditation coach and a mindfulness coach um and then alongside that i started to train in relaxation therapy um and then from there the events that i was putting on uh, i always had i wanted to bring music into it i see the music as being a very connective and valuable source of inspiration and so when I first started to teach yoga, I was teaching vinyasa, which is the, the breath based, very uh, movement oriented where you link one posture to the next in a flow sequence. And so I would create and curate these playlists that would, would accompany it so that it would take us through these states of the warm up all the way, you know, into the peak and back down again. And, um, yeah i feel like making a playlist is a love language (laughs) (laughs) and so um a little bit further down the line i then started to bring in um mixing the music myself so Mm -hmm. my husband has been a dj since he was really young like 15 he was like yeah 14 15 he had a set of turntables and um, so he brought music into our house as well. And, and we spent a lot of our kind of twenties and probably half of our thirties as well, traveling for music. So we would go to music festivals all over the world. Like literally we we've been to Coachella. We've been, you know, we've, really? we've been to festivals in Tennessee, um, all over Europe, Portugal, Spain. Um, and so he taught me um, to DJ at mm-hmm. home. So I'd be a little, what they call a bedroom DJ. So uh, <laughs> or I'd, I'd, I'd DJed at our wedding actually. Um, on the day after the wedding, I did a set. And um, I, so over the years, I've kind of built that up, the skills with that, I built that up. Um, and then a few years ago, with the rise of ecstatic dance, which is a sober, um, barefoot, substance-free, um, barefoot, phone-free um, experience. I then had been going. I'd been living in Bali for a little bit, mm-hmm. teaching yoga, mm-hmm. and I got to know a couple there, and they would hold cacao ceremonies with ecstatic dance so I, for over a few years i would go back to bali and i would um, go to these ecstatic dances there um, and then i ended up training with them to learn the facilitation of ecstatic dance so um that then comes into the wild calm where often now when i teach the the yin session like what you came to i now combine that <laughs> with a a dj set so mm. i don't dj live whilst i'm doing it I, I do the dj mix and then um i play it throughout the throughout the session but again it's very personal mm-hmm. um to what feeling i want to evoke um or or what kind of mood and the energy can really shift through through the musical journey of it mm. um, you also uh, sorry go on oh, yeah, yeah but so, um yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's a I blue pen. What <laughs> <Go on. laughs> um so i 
Yeah, so I bring that in as well as as some other components that I've that I've learned uh, along my path of, of training. It's been a continuous since training to be a yoga teacher since my first two hundred hour yoga teacher training during which I then realized how little I knew about <laughs> yoga and knew that I wanted to learn more about the human body anatomy anat- yeah anatomy that doesn't sound right autonomy um, anatomy another <laughs> <laughs> <that> blooper <laughs> anatomy um and then also you know about the energy body um and then from the very start with with yoga i was really intrigued by the philosophy of it by the ancient texts and uh, the teachings in that sense so that's always been a huge part of what i teach as well Mm -hmm. Oh, amazing. So you also do the sound healing. We will get back into yoga, but you also do sound healing because I went to one of your um, sound healing events with uh, your friend Joanna and Paulina. And oh, my God, it is so beautiful. You can see the um, feminine energy just coming through that, you know. Um, Can you tell us more about that? You know, what is the energy behind it? Yeah, so um, the three of us kind of organically came together with that. Mm. Um, We are all doing our own work in different healing fields. And um, essentially, you're right, it was about the merging of the feminine energy Mm -hmm. and for the sound healing itself to feel like you were walking into, uh, you know, a, a a nourishing environment we just wanted people to feel held and relaxed and so when your nervous system can relax then you're better able to respond to change on a cellular level and the sound healing as as you said everything is energy and the vibrations of a, of sound are able to create ripples of change within the physical body because we're what like 80 percent water Uh, And so it responds really well to sound and vibration. So when there's three of you and we create like this, this trifecta then, so we're always surrounding the room and the sound is bouncing off one another. So you're, you're kind of held in this love bubble. um, And each one, we, we curate that as a journey as well. So um, we draw upon something that we're working with um so whether that would be shamanic healing mm-hmm. um we even brought tantra into one of them as um tantra is the biggest part of my work right now mm-hmm. and that's where i'm at currently and we we combine these different modalities that essentially they all feed into one another mm-hmm yeah so let's talk about tantra and um yoga yoga tantra i've never heard of that one before what is it what's going on there (laughs) okay so tantra is probably one of the most misunderstood and misconstrued or misinterpreted of the yogic teachings tantra is essentially yoga Mm -hmm. and so the the texts that are from 200 ce like the the, you know the the first millennium they were some of the first texts to ever be found in in yogic um teachings Uh, and so these ancient and mystical texts then have been translated throughout the years they've been passed on through various lineages um however with tantra there is no particular way of teaching. So everyone that is on a tantric journey will have a independent uh, journey and will will find their own way with it. Um, But the misconstrue really, when I mention the word tantra, the most common response that I get is that people assume that it is sexual practices yeah there is something in there of a sexual nature and whilst a small part of tantra certainly is 
what that is speaking about is actually neo tantra which is this modern teaching on sacred sexuality so that in itself is a different is a modality by itself um, and so there are various ways with tantra of being introduced to it they, they name them colors white tantra red tantra but there's also pink tantra in between the white and the red and then there's black tantra um and so left hand right hand and they all kind of lead to one another mm. one way or another however you find yourself in there you will eventually um find yourself learning from the the other pieces of it so um tantra is a a tradition it's texts it's it's practices and within those practices are some of the very basic things that we need to feel the full vitality of our life. Mm -hmm. um, and so Tantra works with polarities, with the masculine and the feminine energy that is present within us, and then the balance of the two. And so in some ways, that is where the sexual side of it was misconstrued. As it is often portrayed, you'll see this image of Shiva and Shakti, and they, the, 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 God, the primordial parents of the universe, they are like the, the god and the goddess that are everything. So Shakti is the goddess of creation, and Shiva is the god of spaciousness, consciousness. And so without one another, what we experience would not exist. So different fields of thought see it in different ways maybe see it as the big bang um you know what, what, however um we we look at this but the essentially behind this image of shiva and shakti making love that is displayed in ancient temples hindu temples in rajasthan um, and there are these sculptures and etchings and carvings of which the Karma Sutra came mm. out of and it shows them making love but actually what this is speaking of is the union of the masculine and the feminine energies coming together and then sometimes that is is misconstrued oh wow so how can people channel that energy what can they do to channel it so again there are certain practices rituals um breathing techniques one really simple breathing technique is to breathe fully right down into our root right down into the energy at the base of our spine and behind our sexual organs and just to pull our breath down there to soften and then to exhale that out of the mouth so when we're born we are born fully into feeling bliss into feeling pleasure that is our birthright and then throughout the our life we start to have experiences that maybe shroud that um, and we become conditioned and we forget and as we get older our breath then responds to life mm. and it becomes shallow and it's like we're just breathing to survive just about we're, we're not taking in the fullness of the breath and when that's not happening we're not feeling the the full vitality that we could feel in our body as our circulation is then poorer um, with poor circulation it leads to deterioration and with good circulation, it leads to vitality. And so a lot of the tantric practices, the physical practices are around the cultivation of this energy at the base of the spine, mm -hmm. which is um, in Sanskrit is Kundalini energy. Um, and so this Kundalini energy that is sometimes depicted as like a, a serpent or a snake and it's said to form in the womb when when we are created in the womb and then it coils itself around the spine three and a half times like a sleeping serpent and then it holds the rest of our energy in stasis mm. um, and so this energy at the base of the spine we can 
move it up we can unravel it and we can and we can use it to create more vitality in the whole of the body and so um this energy at the base of the spine this is is particularly in our root and in our sacral so the lowest part of the belly and this is where the energy of creativity exists so this is our passion our zest for life and and all this fullness for it for life is what we feel when there is movement and flow in in that area mm. um, and so the tantric texts were the first texts to speak of what we now call chakras so a chakra in um sanskrit means wheel and so there's seven main chakras that that rotate in place along the spine from the root to the crown and when these energy centers either become blocked or underactive or overactive then it can take effect on the other chakras mm -hmm. and so working with the energy in that way in tantra is to bring some of this um, vibrancy of the lower chakras up but also to work with healing the, the, the chakras in general and to balancing out the chakras. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of this, the teachings of Neo Tantra uh, or Red Tantra, which works with sacred sexual union. So this cultivation of your sexual energy using a partner that is to heal. And so our sexual energy is our emotional energy as well. And so if we can, if we can use the, the, the energy in this area, which is in charge of the emotions, then we can start to heal the wounds of emotions. So one of the very basic, I don't, I don't teach Neo Tantra, um, but I'm, I, I'm very intrigued by all aspects of it put together. So mm -hmm. it is a part of my studies. Um, but one of the really simple techniques with, with Red Tantra is simply eye gazing. And this doesn't need to be done with a sexual partner, of course. Um, but the aspects of eye gazing is then able to eliminate shame so when we break down those barriers of what the, the discomfort that we feel by staring into the eyes of another it begins to build trust and then with trust your heart starts to open and when your heart starts to open all levels of healing can can occur um, and so that's that's just one way as an example of how how we use um, tantra as as a modality of not just healing but living our lives to our fullest potential so that we we feel it all and that we're we're open we're not closing down um to others and to the interconnectedness of life because you know yoga means union and it's union of mind body spirit mm -hmm. and also the the union of 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 everything around us really mm. and i'm just um going back to the eye gazing it's like um it's so un it's uncomfortable it's so awkward when you first do it it's like because you, you there's a lot of stuff that comes up the awkwardness it's like you know ah uh, how do you how do you okay if somebody's trying to get to that stage where they can comfortably eye gaze another person <laughs> we're always looking at different directions aren't we if someone can comfortably get there what what other tips can you give them to just slowly get into it or well on a practical level yeah. i'd say a shorter amount of time so maybe just try it for 30 seconds mm -hmm. or one minute put a time on it also on a practical level just look at one eye <laughs> <laughs> So that's the hard part when your eyes flit naturally yeah. because
because you can only look at one eye at a time. Yeah, I always, yeah. It's like I'm trying to look at the two eyes, but I can only do the left <laughs> eye. Okay, let me yeah. try get to in in angle with the right eye. No, yeah. no, I missed missed the left eye. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in a way, that's an that's the brain's way again. I think of creating a distraction mm -hmm. because, like you say, it feels awkward, it feels uncomfortable, um, and. <sighs> just to accept what comes up. That's another part of the teachings of Tantra is to accept what is without judgment. Mm. Um, and so when we're able to have no expectation, um, releasing expectations considerably heighten our enjoyment of life because mm. there's a freedom that comes with it. Uh, and Tantra is around liberation ultimately feeling a liberation one way or another um going back to uh your sacral and the sexual tantric energy um you're so right you know about uh our conditioning to think that sex some sexual energy is bad or being labeled as such but i want to kind of just dive deep into uh the blockage of your sacral what is um say if you are if our audiences or anybody is blocked in that area and isn't able to open it up freely how can they work with this energy yeah so a lot of what you find blocks that area like you've just touched upon is shame mm -hmm. so um much of that is shrouded in our experiences when we were younger and um, mm. so I think it's not something that really happens quickly if we think about how long it's taken for us to build up those beliefs and those limits and um, that protective measure really usually comes down to a survival mechanism and mm. um, so it's working with someone in this field that is um experienced in removing blockages so i'd say healing happens on four different levels so there's the physical level so you can work with the body through movement practices breath work practices um dance is is incredible for healing um emotion in in the lower uh, energy centers um, and so there's various things. Yoga is another one. Mm. And then it also happens on an emotional level. So working with shifting emotion mm. in certain ways. I'm also a Reiki practitioner. Mm -hmm. So um, so I work with energy in that way. Um, and then it also healing happens on a mental level. So maybe talk therapy, speaking to um, someone, a therapist, a psychologist in that way. And then it happens on a spiritual level as well. Um, so for me, it, it's kind of going into what the, the root is of it and then working with the, the root of it. Mm. Um, and then healing through those four levels. And mm. so you might find with some people, it's a mental blockage. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, everything's connected, isn't mm -hmm. it? And we have these metaphysical responses within our body when you find that people that say, for example, meth this is a simple metaphysic, people that are very rigid in their thinking, mm -hmm. so they are closed minded, their opinion is the only way and their beliefs are the only ones and they are quite blinkered in their views they're rigid you find they have very stiff bodies uh, oh my god they're yes. very rigid I in their bodies as yes. well they're very tightly wound yeah and, and so they walk very tightly as well very like much in, so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, you know, I yeah, you yeah. Think, oh you're gonna snap but um so so say for example with something like that you could approach it on 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 two levels so if you can soften their body mm -hmm. then their their way of thinking starts to soften and the mind expands and 
and vice versa if there is a way to change the the neural pathways of the mind with that through say nlp or cbt mm. uh, if they see it as a problem that is if, if yeah. it is something they want to work with that is not everybody does um, and then you'll see that their whole body begins to soften their posture changes yeah same with confidence when someone has say had their heart broken mm. and it has beaten their confidence and we start to close we physically close our shoulders in to protect our vulnerable heart mm. and it's a very primal thing that we do and our posture begins to change and then we can move through these um kriyas or these yoga poses that open up across the heart across the shoulders mm -hmm. and your confidence naturally starts to increase mm. oh amazing i've just had a light bulb moment so like you know um I've seen many people, obviously we've seen many people in our lifetime and you come across a lot of people, but there's the rigid thing was like quite uh, interesting where, but I've always also found that the, the body language is rigid. The way of thinking is rigid, but the sexual energy is very open. What is, what is going on there? Like, but they, they would have uh, an issue with commitment, deeper level of emotional commitment but they rigid in okay with just the, you know, casual uh, sex or flings, you know, yeah. things like that, but very, very rigid. What's happening? What do you think is happening there? So what I think I would see happening there is it's still control. It's mm. still about control. So that person, um, like you say, that they, they are rigid in their thinking, they're stiff in their bodies. They are hesitant to commit and hesitancy to commitment is mm. needing to be in control not able to open up vulnerably to another person or show your vulnerabilities um but when it comes to casual sex well there's the key you're still in control it's casual you're not assigning yourself to anything deeper or more meaningful than that therefore no one is scratching beyond the surface of what you're allowing them to see. Mm -hmm. And what you're allowing them to see is a very controlled and compartmentalized version of yourself. Oh, wow. You just said it perfectly. So does that mean that like the heart chakra is blocked in that way? Because emotion, relationships or, or connections in general, friendships, you... Um, you connect through a heart-based connection and the deeper you go the more beautiful it is so be rigid in that way not being open to love but just on the surface seems like a lot of uh, heart-based um mm -hmm. i'd say so the heart the the anahata chakra mm -hmm. um one of the most beautiful you know in sanskrit there's about 500 translations for every sanskrit word yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so such a beautiful language and, and one of the the translations of anahata was that which cannot be destroyed so no matter what the heart goes through, it's simply, the heart has the capacity to take so much. Mm. Um, and it is my belief that the more that we experience through the heart, the bigger it actually grows. It's almost like every experience feeds it and it grows bigger. But the heart, the energy of the heart, all it teaches us is about love. Mm. So it teaches us about trust, about forgiveness, about gratitude mm -hmm. and gratitude actually emanates from the heart mm -hmm. so um in studies they, they found that feeling a sense of gratitude so you can't formulate gratitude in the mind you could repeat the words and, until it starts to sink in but it comes essentially from the energy of the heart and it emits the most strong this the strongest most powerful emotion gratitude mm -hmm. uh, from the heart and of course the brain emits these electromagnetic waves that then send signals to the rest of your body and so mm -hmm. when you feel the the gratefulness in your heart and this emotional response to it then naturally we feel love what we know is and not just romantic love but love for everything and we yeah. are love you know it's not 
something we do it's something we are mm. um but it's multi-layered with the the question around um and maybe rigid or controlling person because that could also come from a lack of self-worth mm. um low confidence um mm. and so an overcompensation for that mm. and, in, and a need to control others um, and so that often is uh, coming from the solar plexus, actually. So this is our warrior wow. energy right here. Mm. Um, and this is our sense of personal power. Mm. And so for someone that is often seeking to gain power over others, which is not powerful at all, by the way, um, that, that comes from low self-worth. Wow, and so that's such a deep insecurity right there um and yeah oh my god that's like wow <laughs> this is so great like it's, it's so interesting getting knowing about how to work with this energy and how it aligns with your center and it aligns with your chakras and like going back to the heart space um I got tuned to Reiki level two like a few weeks ago and I'm doing the 21 day self-healing at the moment. And it's so incredible because like before when I was uh, level one, I just couldn't, you know, I was just healing. It was just, there was, I couldn't feel the proper energy, but now I can. And I can really resonate with a lot of people who, whose hands move in different directions in, in the body. It's like, I used to be like, mm, is this even real? Because I didn't experience it myself, right? So when I got attuned, it's like all of a sudden I'm scanning people's body, you know, as a as a training, my um, amazing um, friend Natasha who trains um, on, the, on Reiki. And uh, I was on, on, I had my hands hovering on the body and it's like my hand was just going in all different directions and I wasn't even moving whatsoever. But, but when I got to the heart space of this person, it was just like my hand just, I couldn't, it was the ball of energy moving up and up and up and up. And my hands were moving up and up and up and up. It means like, so it's like heart is where the center, the expansion is you know um where um you can send that energy down to other chakras as well we're sending it with love you know um and it's such a beautiful uh, energy to work with and also i was um uh watching um as is it, it was who's it called brendan greg brendan he talks about heart coherence um he was basically saying manifesting how manifesting from your heart center is so strong um and they did like they, they did a, a electric magnetic um research he's a, he was a scientist before now he's uh he's like completely spiritual and teaching all of that and and how um the heart's magnetic this is where the the center the point is of everything manifestations and love and the unity um the the togetherness that's where everything is at you know absolutely yeah. yeah yeah and like going back to that sense of gratitude so that those electromagnetic waves that emit from the heart mm -hmm. then that sends messages to the brain and so it's very healing for depression Mm. Um, and th this is how having a gratitude practice works. Mm. Mm. I always give in my workshops is um, the tip when I give them the tips is like 10 things that you're grateful for, you know, write them down, no matter what's going on in your life, write 10 things that you're grateful for. And I'm sure you'll find so many things even little things like roof over my head and food on the table amazing friends palm tree bobby who's like in my <laughs> background right now it's just like it's the feeling behind it is just so beautiful and you know so powerful like completely agree with you on that completely agree um so um before we kind of just wrap up um i wanted to ask you about um I really wanted to ask you when you were in coma, right? Um, now I've heard of people go near death experiences. They had spiritual kind of experiences, right? And um, they come back or they can listen to other people in the room kind of thing. So what was that experience like for you? Um, it was a warning, yeah. to be honest. Um, at that point of my life, I think I was on a path which could have gone as always, you know, sliding doors, it, it could have gone one way or the other. And I was very much 
out of alignment with myself mm. um and i was probably seeking fulfillment in the wrong places mm. um and my immune system due to this was very low mm. it was a it was a unique set of circumstances really mm. i was in india um i was unwell in india and i all i can describe it as was a flu it was like the flu mm. my whole body was aching um i was shivering freezing cold in india at the same time as pouring out sweat everything in my body mm. was aching um so i came home and this was just be, just after christmas 2011 and um in a nutshell i ended up in hospital and on new year's eve they they put me into an induced coma because they could not figure out what was wrong with me mm. except i couldn't breathe and i was getting weaker by by the minute really and mm. so he basically the consultant told me if we don't put you on ventilation you won't see next year so mm. um i was a very poorly girl is how the yeah. doctor actually at the end of the bed yeah. described it you were a very poorly girl i had no idea um, and so I went into a coma and in 2012, eight days later, I was brought out of the coma. In the meantime, what I didn't know was happening is that my organs were beginning to shut down and only 5% of one lung was working. So one lung burst, the other lung, um, collapsed mm. so uh, i had what's called a pneumothorax where oxygen was getting into the parts of the chest where they shouldn't it shouldn't it should be contained mm. into your lungs and um, so essentially i was um suffocating myself that's mm. what happens with a pneumothorax and so they called my husband and my mum and they told me to they told them to say goodbye that really? they didn't think i was going to make it mm -hmm. and that night i pulled through and they wow. took me off ventilation the next day so, um yeah so when you were in um how, what were you feeling were like around what could you hear people when you were in coma or i don't think so if i'm to be i wish i could i wish i had a story um, there's, there's a lot of things that merged, but basically from a medical level, when you are put into a coma, you're given five layers of drugs and mm. the base layer is morphine and a lot of morphine. Mm. So, um, you're, you're very sedated and mm. everything about you is sedated. Now, whether for some people that means that the spirit is then able to, you know, that now the physical body is somewhat numbed, the spirit, I don't, I, that truthfully was not my experience. I think that mm. if I hadn't have woken up, that, that would have been that. Mm. Um, but I did come out of the coma and, um, there was things I had a had a lot of visualizations then. However, that could have been down to the um, yeah. morphine. <laughs> yeah. So um, what I would say though is it completely changed the trajectory of my life in that I was not able to continue on the path that I was on then. So it forced me to slow down. Mm. Um, I looked at things a different way. I um you feel invincible when you when you're yeah when your face would death <laughs> yeah you do but prior you know yeah. prior to that I you don't think that something like that would ever would ever happen to yeah. you yeah and um, I felt very vulnerable mm. when I was in 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 the months of because I needed rehab after it mm. um I was in a recovery ward for a while and had a physio I felt very weak and um it kind of question your mortality and all of mm. these questions come up and um yeah as i as i was recovering and life as i knew it 
just looked very different. I lost mm. my confidence. Mm. I remember going out for something to eat and, and feeling like nervous to even speak to the waitress, mm. which is bizarre, something I'd never experienced before. And um, I was kind of like a shell of my mm. former self. And so the one thing that I did do was start to gently practice yoga again. And that really felt like um, a pillar of strength and mm. something that gave me strength so that I, I didn't feel as though this had taken over me and I was almost like a victim to it. And instead it felt empowering. So I built that up from there. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. What, did it happen in 2012, did you say? Yeah. It's quite interesting because um, it seems like you've been, obviously after the experience, you're no longer the person you were. So it seems like you went through your spiritual transformation right there, your spiritual awakening, mm -hmm. real spiritual awakening where, and then that period of where you were, um, you know, unable to uh, get back into the normal world. It's, it seems like a spiritual experience where you lose your identity and then you're going to void the dark, dark night of the soul and then your new identity is formed. And it's not really an identity. It's just you find the essence of who you really are, right? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, and it was from that experience that I, I then decided to train as a yoga teacher. Mm. Um, and so then that took on a whole life as it, of its own, really. So it's in the, the 10 years since that experience that um, my, my spiritual kind of journey really began, definitely. Beautiful, amazing. Um, so how would you sum up your amazing life so far then <laughs> in a nutshell or in in let's say let's say three words <laughs> oh wow three words um, how would you sum your life <laughs> and sum my life as adventure curiosity and learning Beautiful. Amazing. Um, I've got some rapid fire questions here for you. Um, so yeah, it's out there. and then we can just get into what, where people can con contact you and everything. So yeah. Are you ready? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Cool. <laughs> cool. What is your definition of the universe God life? Wow. Um, it is what you make it really. I, I think that um, God exists within you mm -hmm. and that, yeah, the, the opening up to the energies that are around you is really the limit of, of what you're going to mm -hmm. experience with, within your existence. Beautiful. Amazing. What do you think happens? when you die um the body dies the spirit lives on yeah nice how do you define religion and spirituality uh faith both of them to the deepest core amazing um what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn <laughs> <laughs> well i'm probably still learning it aren't i um To let others in and to let people help you is not weakness. Oh, that vulnerability yeah. is not weakness, mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. is strength. Yeah, beautiful. Um, do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures? Not always. Mm. Uh, there's a choice in every moment. And um, I think that we're all here to experience something predestined in a mm. way. And, and until those lessons are learned, you'll continuously keep going back to it one way or another. Mm. So um, I think that like the lotus flower, that there is beauty that grows through adversity mm. and 
there's lessons to to be taken from difficulties that cannot be gained any other way Um, beautiful you know when you live in life on surface level that's all you're gonna get yeah yeah true um i am fully in present excuse me i am fully in present moment when i'm dancing (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) so good uh i was doing a bit of that last night it's like yeah Yeah. (laughs) um do you believe that there is an end to healing no um i think it just changes shape and form and i think that we are always it's like a spiral Mm. and it's it's such a cliche but it's not linear and so you just continuously keep coming round to mm. things that you thought had healed but that you look at them a different way yeah oh my god yeah oh wow boom uh the world needs more of what um the world needs more healers in general and and when i say healers i mean people that are willing to do the work on themselves Mm. continuously Mm -hmm. um and to kind of shine a light on themselves to lead others the same way beautiful what is that one message that you would share to someone who is going through adversity, a spiritual awakening, dark night of the soul, and they can't see the light at the end, end of the tunnel? What would you say to them? I would say that um, to trust that everything that is placed on your path is there for a very specific and important reason, and it's for your soul's evolution. So you've just got to keep on trusting Oh, amazing. Oh, Lisa, thank you. So how can people contact you? Um, so everything comes under the wild calm. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, the wild calm.com is my website. Mm-hmm. And then Instagram and Facebook, the same the wild calm, uh, have wild calm yoga, wild calm events. Yeah. And um, you can book one to ones with me where I kind of work with within different modalities but mostly around tantric um Mm. little practices and um yeah i've got a few events coming up that are on my website plus retreats a couple of retreats this year which is the first time i've done that fantastic and one in the peak district oh my god the portugal one sounds amazing yeah you get a proper holiday out of it as well (laughs) (laughs) amazing thank you so much lisa for coming on i'm sure um many of our listeners will take so much knowledge from you also um really get to know what tantra is you know it might be a change and shift in perspective in some people and some people might gain more knowledge so thank you for sharing that thank you my pleasure thank you for listening to this episode i would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been you can share your thoughts on my facebook or instagram madia sosen if you would like to listen to this episode I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends, as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again, and I will see you in the next episode.